Good afternoon, and welcome to our Critical Issues and Analog SF panel. I'm Lavelle Porter. I'm an assistant professor of English here at City Tech, and I've been to every one of these uh, scientific symposia since we've been having them. So um, thank you to, I always say thank you to Jason for, for putting these together. Um, so you've heard our announcements about uh, the panels and how they run, so please hold your questions uh, to the end in our Q&A uh, session. And I know you will have questions for our panelists. Uh, so our first speaker will be Sharon Packer. Uh, Sharon Packer, MD, is a Mount Sinai affiliated psychiatrist who is in private practice in New York and is the author of many journal articles, books, chapters, and several academic books, including Neuroscience in Science Fiction Film, Cinema's Sinister Psychiatrists, Superheroes, and Super Egos, The Minds Behind the Mask, Movies in the Modern Psyche, Dreams and Myth, Medicine and Movies. There's multiple titles in there that I didn't <laughs> quite have the right punctuation for. Uh, she's a prolific writer, just know that. <laughs> she edited Mental Illness in Popular Culture, Evil in American Popular Culture, and the forthcoming Welcome to Arkham Asylum. Welcome, mm -hmm. Sharon Peck. Oh, thank you. Science fiction, in fact, published stories in its very early incarnation when it's still known as Astounding Stories and Super Science. Astounding started in 1930, and as early as 1931, it published human aid brain exchange stories. Um, by 1934, Astounding was America's top science fiction magazine. Whether it's because of this, I don't know, but here are some two <laughs> pictures of two stories that were published in 1931 and then 1932, both by Arthur J. Burks. First is Manate the Mighty, and the other one is The Mind Master that came in two parts. And Arthur J. Burks was an amazingly prolific pulp author. He published at least 800 stories in the pulps, various genres. He didn't do romance, and he didn't do westerns, but he did a whole lot of stuff. And if you read his work, in Astounding Stories, you'll see he was a really excellent writer, very, very engaging, um, who could tell pictures with words, just like these. Um, however, we come to the next question. What is Man the Mighty about? Well, basically, it's that same old trope. Innocent souls, isolated and alone, shipwrecked on an exotic locale, inhabited by a soul mad and presumed to be a sociopathic scientist who self-segregates from society, far from the scrutiny of civilization. Now, some of you may think you've heard that story before, and if you think that, you're absolutely right. Um, this is a well-known trope, it's tried and true. Some of the great masterpieces of 19th century literature have uh, you know, this kind of imagery, this kind of uh, theme. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1886, and H.G. Uh, Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau in 1896 is even closer to this. <coughs> it's just like, just like a sailor who encounters strange things. 
However, what's particularly interesting, in the same year that Berg's stories appeared, film versions of these two classic, uh, two classic uh, literature, uh, elements of literature appeared. In 1931, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde came out as a film. You can see the lobby card on the side. And The Island of Lost Souls is actually a movie rendition of H.G. Wells' uh, story about Dr. Moreau, and which is really quite close to this story. But still, Burke's storytelling skills were so good that it pulls you in even if you've heard the story over and over and over again. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, where does Darwin fit into this? Uh, it turns out that many films with Darwinian themes were so banned by the Hayes Code from the Production Code Administration Office from the 1930s. The Hayes Code wasn't enforced until 1934, even though it came into being. And it's actually kind of a result of the talkies. Once people could talk in the movies, starting with um, Al Jones, and, uh, and you know, they started saying things they shouldn't. And so the censors got a little bit concerned, and the religious people got concerned. And they lobbied and got uh, the Hayes Code put into being. And they opposed violent, sexual innuendo, and amoral things which included Darwinian evolution, which contradicted uh, religious, uh, at least uh, religious ideology of most people in America. Uh, and in fact, filmmakers actually re removed references to Darwin from Dr. Reynolds' secret, which we'll discuss later, to avoid offending these re religious people. And it wasn't just a moral issue, it was a, uh, a monetary issue, because sometimes these soul films were so shown to uh, test audiences who objected to it, and the movie makers didn't want to lose money. You know, that's something that's been around since time immemorial. Um, so they changed this, and however, even though there were people who were violently opposed to any Darwinian things, there were also people in America in the 1920s and 30s who supported social Darwinism, uh, which is a term that's most associated with the Nazis, but actually came into being in the 1800, late 1800s. The concept of the survival of the fittest was there, was popular in the U.S. in the 1920s and 30s. Fortunately, the U.S. has never been a totalitarian state, like some of the states that adopted that, that idea. So we have a real polarization in the ideology, and it, we see this in some of these films. Um, but why should we even worry about man-monkey transplants? Excuse me for using the word man, it's alliterative. I should say human, but you, you get the point. What do you know, since, uh, for very ancient times, there were myths about transplanting uh, animals and humans and changing their organs. Um, and even in the early 1900s, there were attempts to use animal glands and to you know, transplant goats and different animals, but they weren't terribly successful. However, in 1912, Dr. Alex Carell actually won a Nobel Prize for his advances on transplanting crafting biology. He actually showed a technique where he could revascularize tissues so the transplants would stay. We, we're still far, far, far away from brain transplants, and we still are, but this made this even more possible. And of course, a Nobel Prize makes people even more aware of advances in science. So it's not just the scientists, but also the public that really uh, took note of the possibility. Filmmakers, of course, observed this too, and we can see that there was a surge in, um, in uh, transplant-related films that followed. One of Dr. Carell's graduate students was Dr. Serge Morneau, who became quite a controversial figure, but he gained fame and infamy in both science and film. <coughs> Dr. Morneau was a transplant specialist who became known as the monkey gland man. He first did something nearly miraculous. He, there was a boy who was a Cretan, and that's not an insult, that's actually the term, the medical term for someone who's born with hypofibrinism who has a distinctive physio physiognomy as well as intellectual deficits. And this boy uh, was very, very cognitively impaired. And Dr. Warnock was able to transplant a uh, thyroid gland into him. And the boy uh, became nearly normal intellectually. Of course, the thyroid didn't change his physiological features. He still looked the way he looked. Um, but this you know, gave him a lot of fame and gave him a lot of hope for transplant. So we have some scientific <coughs> things happening here that can make this seem more credible. Then, how does, where does Darwinism come in in 1925? It came, uh, got a lot more attention then because of the Scopes trial. And different kind of attention. The Scopes trial was formerly known as the State of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes, but referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, Scopes was a substitute high school teacher who actually volunteered to be a test case. 
um, to test the Butler Act, which banned teaching human evolution at state funded schools. So this was publicized all over the place, and we still talk about it. Uh, we, we have books about it, um, and you know, it was quite a historic event. So this represented the very opposite approach to the people in the 1920s who were supporting uh, eugenics. And the people, actually the state of California, believe it or not, who started sterilizing quote unquote feeble-minded uh, patients. That's what they called them that time. So California, which we think of as a very, very uh, leftist state today, was actually doing some things that were uh, on the far side of the spectrum at that time. So uh, we find that, you know, once again, America's polarized. But even before this, there's what we call Simeon Cinema, or at least what I call Simeon Cinema. Um, here's a picture of a, from a circus, a, a carnival, of a, a so-called monkey man who goes to church. He's so humanized. However, Pate and Gaumont made movies in the early 1900s about this particular uh, trope. The Monkey Man came out in 1908 by Pate. And Gaumont did the doctor's experiment for reversing Darwin in the same year, where a mad scientist turns men into apes. Um, and we're going to hear more about Gaumont later because he stays active in this field, uh, except for a couple little glitches here during the World War I. Um, there was a problem during World War I besides the war, obviously, which is a big problem. Um, but Gaumont and Pate were the two dominant forces in film. But World War I affected Gaumont terribly um, when over 300 of his employees were drafted, so he didn't have a crew to make movies. Then the other thing, nitrate emulsion film was no longer available or the stocks dwindled because the munitions industry needed the cellulose, the nitrocellulose. And there, that's related to this little picture over here. We let some of our insect experts here uh, determine what this is. This, this picture is not chosen at random, but it has to do with where the nitrate uh, microcellulose comes from. So there was a role in the a man monkey films in the, in the World War I era. But then come 1920, after World War I, we have an upsurge. Go and get it is about a mad surgeon who transplants a convict's brain into an ape. The human brain ape uh, avenges a convict. This is a trope, tried and true trope. We hear it again and again. Something terrible happens to someone, then they be revenge. Um, the idea of uh, sometimes, sometimes something terrible happens and nothing happens from it. But usually this happens. Now here's a story. Uh, from 1922, a blind bargain. Uh, this is an American film, and for what it's worth, it came out in the same year as Dr. Mabuse in Europe with Fitz Hahn. Uh, but in the blind bargain, stars, stars Lon Chaney, who is a horror icon, and we also see with science fiction, there's quite a bit of crossover with horror, not 100%, but it does cross over at times. And uh, whenever you see a name like Lon Chaney or Bella Lugosi, you know it's going to be horror. Uh, I don't see the Vincent Price stuff here yet. But in this particular film, there's a young writer whose mother needs an operation. And this writer is going to do anything to aid his ailing mother. So what happens is a sinister surgeon agrees to operate on the mother, but the son agrees to his unnamed demands, which is the blind bargain. The surgeon, of course, is played by, played by Lon Chaney Singer. Um, the surgeon, his goal is to perfect a technique to instill eternal youth into people. But he groups and the man turns into a monkey. So what happens then? This poor young writer has become a monkey. But there's more to the story. The surgeon has an assistant who's disfigured because he was uh, the product of earlier experiments. And now he's vengeful. So what he does is he releases the monkey, previously the writer, from the captivity, from the cage. He kills the diabolical doctor. And the death, death of the doctor releases the writer from his blind bargain, and he becomes human again. Now, critics dismiss this film for borrowing from earlier film of the literary source. It surely does, I mean, many years over. But the inspiration for the film also can align in actual scientific events of the era, uh, such as Steinach's grand, op grand operation. He was an endocrinologist, uh, Eugene Steinach. And he was often compared to his rival, whom I mentioned earlier, Dr. Gorinov, often known as the monkey gland man. Steinach actually hypothesized that animal gland secretions influence sex drive and performance. And in that case, he was right. And he was actually the forerunner of the anabolic steroid abuse. Today we have a, it's, I'm serious. Even Freud got signed up. Okay, there are a lot of famous people at, uh, in McCormick, who built the McCormick Center in Chicago. He got the sign up operation. A lot of big names would get his procedure. It's really quite interesting. Uh, today we, we sort of criminalize it, but uh, there are ways that people get around it. 
Um, but it was their way back then in the 20s. Um, so the, this is not so far-fetched. But I just should say that this film actually had to be recut into the test audience's objective to seeing the book, The Origin of the Species. Once again, not because of morality, but because of money. They didn't want to lose part of their, their audience. Um, so as I said, there are many social, political parallels, as well as scientific parallels with these uh, human ape uh, films. And we see a lot of them in the 1920s. And after the Scopes trial, the man ape films shift from comedy to horror. Uh, and when the Hayes Code came about, the films were restricted, but a lot of these names shifted to the pulps and, and to the, uh, these other stories which you're discussing. And these things were actually popular through the 1940s as World War II raged in America. And at the time of the British actually restricted horror films, and at the same time that Nazis advocated social Darwinism. Um, even though we talk about social Darwinism in conjunction with the Nazis, this concept of the survival of the fittest was actually coined by a sociologist, Herbert Spencer, in the late 1800s. So these ideas were around uh, quite a bit before, and maybe not attributed to the uh, sources. But anyhow, let's move over to 1936. I'm going to go back to Gomond, whom I mentioned earlier, who, who was a rising star early on, but whose face changed during World War I. In 1936, he comes up with a film called The Man Who Changed His Mind. This movie it's also going to be called by another title, but it starts, well, it starts Boris Karloff, another horror icon. In this case, a brain specialist discovers techniques to change thoughts and souls without brains. He needs to transfer thoughts from one brain to another and leaves the, leaves the first brain drain. Firstly, this reminds me of Batman serials like Dr. Daka when they do that. That's a very popular thing with some of the Batman characters. But, you know, this was near uh, fairly early on. And actually, that has preceded that man by a couple of years, but not too many. So this actually sounds a little bit more like parapsychology than science, even though the films, the sets, the costumes, the operating room, the surgical mask, all the gowns look very realistic. It, that when the film was remade, it was called The Man Who Lived Again. Um, in 1941, we have a curious film um, it's a Poverty Row film, and the mere fact that it's called Poverty Row tells you automatically that it's a you know, low budget, low production value, but it certainly does uh, carry on with this thing. It begins with the narration by the protagonist's sister, who's an aspiring actor who moved to New York City, but is tricked into white slavery. To save his, his sister, the brother, who still lives in the hometown, um, and who works as a church organist there, and is the epitome of being wholesome and you know, innocent and all that, he arrives in New York City, but he somehow gets framed for murder, convicted, incarcerated, and eventually executed. Um, however, a few things happen before that happens. Um, you can see it, this image, is, we see this over and over. It could be King Kong, but here it is, uh, the monster from the girl. Yeah. King Kong was 1933. Maybe they recycled these six before Photoshop. Uh, but in any event, in 1941, in the courtroom, the brother threatens the gangster with vengeance. But when he's awaiting his execution, the warden comes into the room, into his cell or another, and asks if the doctor can use his brain for a transplant after his death. And he consents because he's nothing but Peru's. So the doctor who's played by George Zuko, who's once again a recurring character in these kinds of films, transplants the brother's brain into the gorilla, and the gorilla kills the criminals who framed him. And as a film ended, the gorilla is killed, but no one guesses his human identity. So that's um, an interesting sort of film. It functions as science fiction, but it's also a courtroom melodrama. And it has very strong traffic as a film noir because it's informed by psychoanalysis with repressed memories, flashbacks, dreams, and it has that vocal narration which became characteristic of film noir. And of that internal dialogue which was informed by psychoanalysis. The New York Times called it one of the most schizophrenic films ever come out of Paramount. You know, you know, they've had a lot of competition of bad films. Um, but in any event, here's another pretty bad film, um, which has the same motif, The Strange Case of Dr. Rx from 1942. And this one has um, a mad scientist that come in just kind of out of nowhere. It's actually by a criminal defense lawyer who, who wants to show everyone his brilliance, who's quite confident. And so what he does is he gets his uh, clients who are mobsters acquitted. Um, and then what happens is these mobsters start getting killed, and they suspect there's a serial killer who's killing all these people who just got acquitted. 
So what happens, he hires a private eye to try to track this down, and eventually they won't track it down. And here's Crash Corrigan, I don't know if you've ever seen him. This is an actor who owned his own gorilla suit and got lots and lots of work because he made a gorilla suit. Um, so there he is, uh, you know, he was never without work. And once again, um, you know, we see that for some, somehow, uh, even though Dr. Rx captures the private, Dr. Rx actually captures his private eye at some point and tries to drive him insane by strapping him on a table pretending to exchange him spray for gorilla. He never gets that far, and it really comes out of left field. Um, you know, these are not high quality films here. They are, when they call them B films, they are definitely B films and not C's or D's. Um, <laughs> but look, um, anyhow, the plot twist when we where the attorney murdered the mobsters is an act of judge, justice to get him acquitted. Then we come to a more interesting one, Dr. Randall's Secret, 1943, which was written by the same person who wrote Phantom of the Opera. So this is a little bit better film. It's an American film in a remote French village. It's been set in a remote French village um, where, with so George Succo again, where a young doctor arrives in France to wed his fiance, but the fiance um, lives in a castle with her uncle, or she, he has, she has an uncle there, and this uncle has a strange looking servant. The uncle is a doctor. It turns out that the servant is not actually a person from Java, they say he is, but he's actually an ape who has been transformed by the doctor. And um, this film is interesting because it shows EEG tracings. EEG tracing, EEGs were invented in 1929. In 1939, EK, um, ECT uh, <coughs> was invented. It couldn't have been possible without EEG. Of course, ECT remains forever controversial. So this is an interesting one. We have the Ape Man in 1943 with the Uh Very similar thing. Then we have an interesting one, Captain Blonde Woman, which I think comments as much about women's roles during World War II as it does about science fiction. Um, it's about an endocrinologist who experiments on human sur on a surface gorillas to make them work. Um, he does such a good job on it that his uh, test subject, who's originally Sheila but becomes Paula, is good enough to get a job in the um, in the circus. And another doctor thinks he can do a better job on her, so he um, kidnaps her and tries to do surgery and not just endocrinology. Um, it turns out that uh, she meets a man who works in the circus, she gets aroused, she returns to an animal state, and he makes comments about that. And she goes back to rescue her beloved, but she still she reverts to her gorilla state and they think she's still a gorilla and they kill her. Now we can look at you know, the role of women in uh, the early in the forties when World War II was going on and women were taking those roles in the factories and the offices and see what this has to say, but I don't think I have enough time to say anything about it. So anyhow, just to conclude, why should we rethink Darwin? Well, Darwin wrote the Order of Species in 1859. Um, social Darwinism and survival of the fittest comes from the late 1800s. I, we can't, I can't forget the fact that eugenics was popular in America in the 1920s and 30s, uh -huh. and Hitler actually borrowed his eugenics policies from California and adopted this for the Justify Eugenics and Genocide and Operation T4, where he killed um, mental patients, 200,000 of them. Um, after World War II, not surprisingly, social Darwinism was unpopular in America, uh, America post-World War II. So the moral of the story is that science fiction is not just fiction, it makes us rethink important moral and ethical issues as much as scientific issues. So what happens in the end? Here's the end. I'll let you guess where the evolution goes. <laughs> so our next speaker you heard from earlier uh, this morning is Stanley Schmidt. Stanley Schmidt is a PhD in physics. He was the editor of Analog for a long time, 34 years to be exact and enjoys writing for it now just as much now as he did before he became editor in 1978. His recent contributions include the serialized novel, Night Ride and Sunrise, now available from Fox Acre Press, and stories, articles, and guest editorials of various shapes and sizes. A small collection of Dr. Schmidt's many accolades and accomplishments include the Hugo Award for Best Editor, short form, the SFWA Solstice Award, and the Robert A. Heinlein Award, given for outstanding published works 
in science fiction and technical writings that inspired the human exploration of space. When not reading analog just for fun, Dr. Schmidt can be found hiking, traveling, and playing various sorts of music. You can find out more information about him on his website at sfwa.org forward slash members forward slash Stanley Schmidt. And I'm Stanley Schmidt. Oh, now the first thing I have to do is figure out how I run the slides because I didn't ask anybody before we started. Um, this is exactly the result I was hoping for. <laughs> there we are. Okay. And you can just press the space bar to advance or use the arrow to make it. Okay. Okay. Uh, First of all, I'll, I'll confess up front that I am not going to be as scholarly as some might in a scholarly symposium. Uh, I have no spreadsheets, no <laughs> graphs, no exhaustive histories of anything, but I do plan to give you a bit of a survey of an important, but I think often neglected uh, current that runs through the whole history of the magazine. I would like to preemptively thank Frank and Jay, wherever Jay has gone to, uh, for foreshadowing and sort of paving the way for me. I'm talking about humor and analogs. Analog editors have always believed that their first duty is to entertain in a very broad sense, but as stories and articles have usually tried to do more than that, often exploring serious questions about human, humanity's possible futures. Humor has often been an important part of that process magazine has had enough stories, in fact, in which humor was prominent to generate an entire anthology feature novel, for which you see the cover there. It could have generated many others, and maybe someday it will. This is Jack Gunn's cover for the anthology analog slider side. The graphic, the giant walker machine, the walking war machine about to step on a banana peel is intended to suggest visually that the book's contents have a streak of humor in them that does, does not represent the specific kinds of humor that are most likely to be found in analog. Those are more likely to involve satire, irony, and playing with speculative ideas, as for example, in Timothy Zahn's short story, The President's Doll, which was about a fusion of voodoo and acupuncture with a scientific basis and a political application. I picture that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Then go read the story. Astounding slash analog, I didn't use the terms interchangeably rather than plating you with slashes all over the room, has long had a tendency toward intellectual playfulness, which has manifested itself in all parts of the magazine. The most obvious place, of course, is in the stories, since they make up the majority of the content. These range from extremely short stories, sometimes less than a page. The minimum word count that we ever had for a short short was zero. <laughs> <laughs> the, the title was Nuclear Winter, no, Nuclear Spring. The story was a page of blank paper. <laughs> uh, two novelettes like Christopher Anvil's The Gentle Earth. Uh, about extraterrestrials caught off guard by Earth's balmy climate, which you in New York have some experience with. Uh, two serialized novels like Paul Anderson's A Bicycle Built for Brew, the climax of which involves an impromptu emergency spacecraft powered by warm beer. Some of our stories have been, I, I'm still saying our, even though I'm no longer part of the management, but I, I haven't really let go. Some of our stories have been primarily humorous, but humor can play a significant role even in the most serious narrative. Sometimes it's just an occasional bit of comic relief, like a funny incident or the name of a place or a character or a concept. Uh, for instance, uh, Pazilla Wheat. Mixy Poxy, the Granny Smith computer, 
uh, an, account, an account executive named, named Bodenzoller, which give or take in Mullnaut means bean counter in German, <laughs> uh, to the Martian bartender in a bicycle built for brew, whose name Paul Anderson didn't um, remember when I asked him to pronounce it, but it is Sarmischkadu von Himmelschmidt. Um, and sometimes the humor can be kind of dark, as for instance in a short story by Robert Olson called Paleontology as an Experimental Science, which is told as a series of short scientific papers with a steadily diminishing number of co-authors. <laughs> Uh, this was about a project to bring back a Tyrannosaur. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> or a situation in uh, one little passing scene in a novella called The Thrust of Greatness, where the world is literally falling apart and its future is at stake, and the UN Security Council is dilly-dallying over what, if anything, to do about it. And one pedantic member of the council says to another, Surely I don't need to remind the council that the question of whether a question is procedural or substantive is substantive, <laughs> which sounds so ludicrous in the context that some readers assumed I made it up to make fun of bureaucracies. But in fact, I quoted it directly from the council's own rules. <laughs> Sometimes humor shapes the whole narrative, exaggerating current or anticipated um, trends to facilitate thinking about difficult issues or sometimes just because it's fun. Sometimes the serious and comic elements can be comparably important in this, even in the same story. Uh, my wife and collaborator, Joyce Schmidt, yonder, uh, wrote a story called Opportunity Knox, which on the face of it is a lighthearted little tale about a little girl who goes trick-or-treating and knocks on a door which is answered by an alien spy. They're equally scared of each other, but their little story is set firmly within a much larger and very serious background, swiped from an earlier novel of mine. Even when a story's primary intent is to amuse, if it's going to do it in analog, it still has to be science fiction, meaning there's a speculative element so integral to the narrative that it can't be removed without making the whole story collapse. And there's a reasonable effort to make the speculation at least marginally plausible. This, by the way, was my working definition of science fiction as far as analog is concerned. My usual rule for applying that test was that anything that couldn't be seriously, rigorously proved impossible was fair game for science fiction uh, as long as the author made at least a reasonable hint at how it might not be impossible either by using established science or by imagining new science that could conceivably be discovered in the future. In predominantly humorous stories, of course, that principle can be applied with more poetic license than in a strictly serious story. The caricature can't be judged by the same standards as a photograph. If the tone of the story makes it clear from the outset that the author isn't taking him or herself too seriously, the reader may not either. And there are little tricks that writers use for establishing that they're not taking themselves too seriously at the beginning of the story. Uh, character names can be a trick for doing it. Uh, example, Gray Rollins did a series of stories about a human private eye with an alien sidekick named Victor. Uh, Victor looked like an up upright three foot high sausage with stubby legs, a single eye, a voice mechanism that could imitate any sound from a chirping frog to a full symphonic orchestra. He had a wry sense of humor, a long prehensile tongue, and a taste for well-aged garbage. If you, if you met Victor in a predominantly serious story, you might wonder how such an unlikely critter evolved and would appreciate, it would undermine your ability to appreciate the story. Somewhat similarly, Harry Turtledove, who is often considered the reigning master of alternate history, recently wrote Bone Hunters, which is about field paleontologists descended from dinosaurs in a parallel present in which humans did not inherit the Earth. Uh, 
Um, by the way, Trevor didn't even pay me for this plug, but as it happens, we have here in this room the first copies out of the January-February issue of Analog, which has another story by Harry Turtle Dove in the same vein called The Quest for the Great Prey Bossy. Any resemblance to Moby Dick is truly coincidental. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, since the world of bone hunters is set in what we know as the American West, Harry couldn't resist giving their culture a lot of the flavor and some of the cliches of our Western movie. A literal-minded critic might say, that wouldn't happen. But the story is so much fun that many readers just accepted it and went along for the ride. Victor and the dinosaurs aren't impossible, just improbable. Just as many of the things that happen in almost any comedy do occur in real life, but seldom in such concentrated doses. Similar considerations apply when an analog author gets the urge to apply a scientist's or engineer's way of thinking to what's usually thought of as a fantasy concept. I already mentioned the President's Doll as an example. There have been enough, uh, enough others that I've toyed with the idea of doing another anthology, anthology called Fantasy with Rivets, a collection of fantasy stories with an analogish twist, like Stephen A. Callis's Murphy, which was about the technologically unemployed leprechaun who invented the profession of gremlin. Readers will let an author get away with more in a good comedy than in a story that's trying to be taken seriously, but there are limits. The outright impossible, like sound traveling in a vacuum, or a spaceship going 10 times the speed of light just by carrying a really big gas tank and keeping the pedal down for a long time, still won't apply with analog readers. There's a special kind of short, short story, especially identified with analog, common to this started back in Astounding, commonly featured as a separate category called Probability Zero, which, as the name suggests, sometimes intentionally does use something impossible. The original idea was that a Probability Zero was a tall tale for science nerds. A very short story, usually under a thousand words, with a punchline that seemed plausible until the reader realized that there was some subtle flaw in one of the premises or the ensuing logics that meant logic that made it impossible. The definition gradually made, became more flexible. Some probability zeros aren't particularly impossible, implausible at all, but are just labeled as such to distinguish them from the uh, stories that are longer, that people usually think of as short stories. However, that distinction, too, has been blurry. The magazine recently has been publishing more very short stories without labeling them differently from longer short stories. <clears throat> Since the magazine has published more fiction than anything else, most of the humor is found there, but it has also crept into every other area. As you've already seen, many of the stories are illustrated, <coughs> and artists sometimes provide their own little humorous touches that go beyond what the author put in. I've shown you examples by Jack Gaughan, Kelly Fries, H.R. Van Donken, John Alleman, Tomislav Tukulin. Sometimes artists of that caliber don't just illustrate what the author wrote, but add a little humor as such as that they thought of that the author might later wish that he had. In fact, Kelly Fries once illustrated a novelette of mine called Lost Newton, which uh, he Put some added some tidbits to the illustrations that I liked so much that when I later expanded the novelette to a novel called Newton and the Quasi Apple, I wrote Kelly's editions into it. He called me names when I told him this, but I could tell from the way he was chuckling that he was pleased. <laughs> uh, sometimes artists, notably Ed Emschwiller, who usually signed his work just Emsch did covers that didn't illustrate at all a story at all, but told their own little story all by themselves, like Pastoral, showing a boy walking down a country lane with uh, a somewhat different sky and uh, creatures on the landscape than you might see in the typical country lane scene that you've encountered in the past, or adventures somewhere else, showing what's pretty obviously a terraforming crew somewhere far away uh, watching movies about Arizona. 
Not even the nonfiction parts of the magazine are completely immune. Editorials have been an important part of it almost since the beginning, and these have been about a very wide range of hugely serious subjects. But I once ran a guest editorial called An Alien Viewpoint, commenting on a range of human foibles, ostensibly as seen by C.S. Bushnick, who was my pet corn snake at the time. <laughs> And I assure you that the snake does have an alien viewpoint. They, they see things quite differently than we do. There have even been occasional fact articles, like the Einstein-Murphy interaction. You know, about, you know who Einstein was. You know who Murphy was. Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will. Uh, the Einstein-Murphy interaction was a perfectly normal-looking fact article, a scholarly analysis based on sound physics, about why the bread always falls jelly side down. That was also one of the rare occasions when analog reprinted something that first appeared somewhere else. For a while, I wondered how the authors had managed to get something so funny past the editor of such an august academic publication as Gravitation and General Relativity, until I realized that the senior author of the article was the editor of Gravitation. <laughs> <laughs> Analog has long used a wide range of fillers for cases where a story ended before the page did. This is another thing that we didn't mention on the editor's panel this morning, by the way, is that when you're picking what stories go into an issue, one thing you have to consider is that it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You have to pick the lengths, lengths so that they add up to the number of pages you have to fill. No more, no less. So these fillers have included everything uh, from the light verse of Robert T. Lundy, who was doing quite a few of them back in the early part of this century, uh, to fake ads couched in such language that they appear to be about something other than their real subject, like Michael A. Banks' ad for the first personal computer, True Intelligence, not available in any store. You can think about what that might be. <laughs> One of the most frequent types of filler is a thought-provoking quote uh, which may be from a real thought provoker like Galileo or Mark Twain or Richard P. Feynman, but many have been attributed to Calvin Throop, a shadowy figure, some call him fictitious, <laughs> whose byline has been used by quite a few analog authors, sometimes even on actual stories. <laughs> the first of these actual stories was, uh, I believe, called The Blue Pencil Throop, which was a set of uh, letters to the editor as they answered by Kelvin Throop when he sneaked into the office one night and answered the letters as they should have been answered. <laughs> the culmination of all this may well have been the special spoof issue for mid-December 1984 with Kelvin Throop as the guest editor. He provided the guest editorial and tampered with everything including the letters to the editor and the convention calendar. He even ran his dialogue, and I sprang that uh, the, the dialogue, in case you don't know, is the magazine's monthly contributor bio, where there's a, uh, a brief biography, one-page biography, of an author or an artist or somebody like that. In this case, it was Kelvin Thrill, the uh, guest editor for that issue. We even ran his dialogue, and I sprang for 25 cents cigar as a prop for the photo. Everything in the issue had something jokish in it, one way or another, including part two, the only part that ever appeared, of a serial whose title was an obvious takeoff on Gordon R. Dixon's The Tactics of Mistake. Didactics of Mystique. <laughs> in my opinion, humor is an exceedingly important, important thing in our culture and generally underrated. It hardly ever wins major awards. But most people, I think, when they find a piece that really appreciate, uh, that resonates with them, they really appreciate it. When I was editing, I would have liked, ideally, to have at least one genuinely funny piece in every issue. I didn't always succeed at that because humor is hard to write, and readers don't always agree on what it is. Sometimes they just don't get it. When we ran the spoof issue, which was plainly labeled as such, we got so many letters we're wondering where part one of that serial was. <laughs> we had to make up a form letter explaining that it was a joke. 
when some readers didn't recognize that the personal computer in Michael Banks' tab was a human baby, Mike got another article out of explaining it. <laughs> Sometimes readers do get it, but don't want it. In the words of the jester Jack Point in Gilbert and Sullivan's Yeoman of the Guard, what is all right for B would quite scandalize C, for C is so very particular. Once Mike Flynn, Michael Flynn, our keynote speaker, speaker later this afternoon, wrote a fact article for Analog and wove a few bits of levity into it. One reader wrote in, objecting vehemently that he had dared to be so frivolous in an otherwise fine piece of scholarship, and that I had let him get away with it. Coincidentally, on the very day I got that letter, Mike came into the office to meet me for lunch. So he sat down. I offered to show him that letter in case he wanted to reply to it. He read it through with no visible expression, then passed it back to me and asked if I wanted his answer. Yes, please, I said. And he said, like no. <laughs> Worth the advice, I think, and perhaps more important now than at any time in recent memory. Writing humor with wide appeal is particularly hard at a time when so many people are primed to take offense at so many things. And that fact may point out a heightened need for it. Many psychologists and writers have observed that humor seems to be a natural escape valve for tensions that might otherwise be released only through overt violence. I don't have time to go into this in depth today, but I have written more about it in editorial sensory deprivation way back in September 1992, suggesting that this is not a new problem. But I can't help wondering whether we might have less actual violence in our present world if our societies, societies had not become so intent on suppressing so many forms of humor. In any case, as one who has enjoyed a long and peculiar association with analog, I'm grateful that humor has long been an important part of the magazine's character, and I hope it will remain so far into the future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edward M. Waisaki. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins University. He is now retired after more than 30 years with uh, Martin Marietta Lockheed Martin. He is a charter member of the Heinlein Society and a member of the Science Fiction Research Association, also a member. He has published various short articles and notes in the Heinlein Journal and Science Fiction Studies. The book chapter, The Creation of Heinlein's Solution Unsatisfactory in Practicing Science Fiction, Critical Essays on Writing, Reading, and Teaching the Genre. And he also has three self-published books, The Great Heinlein Mystery, Science Fiction, Innovation, and Naval Technology, and Astounding War, Science Fiction in World War II, and Out of This World, Ideas and the Inventions They Inspired. Uh, the title of my talk is Just the Facts, Articles in Campbell's Astounding Analog. I would like to begin on a personal note. The first issue of Analog that I encountered was February 1968. When I looked at the table of contents, I saw the article To Make a Star Trek by G. Harry Stein. As this was when the original series was being aired, it is most likely the reason that I purchased that issue. Of course, I did get around to reading the fiction, which is what brought, brought me back to the next issue and the next, and so on. But it all started with the article. Why should there be nonfiction in a science fiction magazine? To answer that question, we must look at different magazines, including pre-Campbell Astounding, and how they handled such material. If we go back a number of years, we encounter the early magazines of Hugo Gernsback. The first was Modern Electrics, which began in 1908. Well, according to Gernsback, the purpose of the magazine was to teach the young generation science, radio, and what was ahead for them. Along with the technical articles, the issues usually contained works of science fiction usually by Gernsback. Shortly after selling Modern Electrics in 1913, Gernsback created a new magazine, The Electrical Experimenter. 
In addition to technical articles, it contained both speculative nonfiction and science fiction. This pattern continued after it became science and invention in 1920. When Gernsback created Amazing Stories in 1926, he could have inverted the pattern of his previous magazines and included some fiction, nonfiction, to go with the fiction. But he didn't. Except for his editorial, each issue contained only science fiction. In response to a reader's suggestion in 1927 that the magazine include a feature to report interesting technical items, Gernsback said, Amazing Stories is a purely fiction magazine, and for the present, we intend to keep it as such. Gernsback then decided to include a feature, first appearing in August 1927, called What Do You Know? It was a list of science questions, giving the page where each answer could be found in the story. This feature was continued in Amazing Stories, even after it passed out of Gernsback's control. <coughs> when he created Science Wonder Stories, Gernsback had a similar feature, What is Your Scientific Knowledge? Plus another feature called Science News of the Month. To this was added science fiction questions and answers. Now let us look at the early years of astounding. There were no science quizzes or pages of general science news. Almost from the beginning, however, there were short, uncredited notes that presented interesting scientific facts. These existed until the end of Clayton's astounding in March 1933. When the first Street and Smith astounding with F. Orlin Tremaine as editor appeared in October 1933, the notes had been replaced by short items relating to unexplained strange occurrences. This experiment lasted for only one issue. The technical notes started again in November 1933 but lasted for only three issues. The next appearance of something other than fiction was a presentation in eight installments, beginning in April 1934, of Charles Fort's book, Low. Fort's book may be described as an uncritical presentation of strange and unexplained phenomena from all over the world. Not science fiction, but not very scientific either. Following the completion of Lowe in November 1934, there was another interval during which no items of nonfiction appeared in Astounding. This interval ended in June 1936, when there began a series of 18 articles on the solar system. The person to whom Tremaine had given this assignment was John W. Campbell, Jr. The articles containing a mixture of fact and speculation were very popular. In his editorial in October 1936, Tremaine said, it has been most pleasing to note the approval which has greeted the science articles on the solar system. It has been almost universal, and that guides my thoughts along a promising channel of interest. Other articles began to appear in Astounding before Campbell's series had finished. There was Fourth Dimensional Possibilities by Harry D. Parker in December 1936, followed by The Dawn of the Conquest of Space by Willie Lay in March 1937, and then others. This look at the beginning of the articles in Astounding led to a few questions for which I cannot, at this time, provide answers. One, what inspired Tremaine to begin the series of articles? Two, why did he select Campbell to write them? Three, did the ability of Campbell to deliver a successful series of articles have any bearing on his joining the staff of Astounding in October 1937? Although the articles began <coughs> under Tremaine, they are properly identified with Campbell. His articles were the prototypes for those that followed. In November 1939, in his editorial invitation, Campbell said that the articles were steadily gaining importance and interest. His efforts to obtain technically accurate, yet readable articles on a wide range of topics were emphasized in his April 1940 editorial, Let's Make It Stronger. The difference in how nonfiction was presented was based on the audience to which each type of magazine 
was aimed. A quote from Sam Moskowitz stated, Amazing's, amazing's more sens sensational adventures for the younger readers, thrilling wonders, slightly more thoughtful stories for the older teenagers, an astounding, sensitive, and mature approach for adults. Although Moskowitz was referring to fiction, we may apply such reasoning to the presentation of nonfiction. The quizzes and similar features were aimed at the younger readers and the serious technical articles at the more mature readers. Gernsback felt that science fiction magazines could be used to educate the readers about science. Campbell was less interested in educating the readers and more interested in providing them with ideas for stories. I suggested another reason was to make these magazines with their far out stories seem a bit more respectable. Let us now look at the articles that appeared while Campbell was editor. My focus is on the authors, which will also lead to the subject of some of the articles. The basis of my analysis was the Internet Speculative Fiction Database. The span was from January 1938 to December 1971, which is exactly 34 years or 408 issues. The analysis was based on a table of contents listed for each issue in the database. The result was a list of authors identifying each issue in which an article by that author appeared. I did not count any article that was specifically credited to the editor. I also did not count any uncredited article. This means that I did not count most of the technical notes or fillers which began to appear again starting in March 1938. <laughs> multiple authors of an article were each credited. Each installment of a multi-part article was separately counted. The result was 527 entries representing 169 <laughs> authors. I was able to place these entries in groups. Slightly over half of the entries were for articles by minor authors those who have written either only one or very few articles. Some may have also had fiction published in Astounding or Analog or elsewhere, but were not well-known authors. Moving on to those authors with a greater number of appearances, let us first consider John Campbell. By my count, there were 41 articles credited to either John Campbell or his alter ego, Arthur McCann. I then considered authors who were as well known for their fiction as their articles. The two that I placed in this category were Isaac Asimov of 17 articles and L. Sprague de Camp with 23. Next we come to authors primarily known for their fiction, but who also have articles in Astounding or Analog. The number of authors is small, so I will simply <clears throat> run through the list. Paul Anderson with two articles, <coughs> Ben Bova five, A. Bertram Chandler one, Hal Clement two, Gordon Dixon one, Randall Garrett one, Robert Heinlein one, L. Ron Hubbard three, Malcolm Jameson seven, Raymond F. Jones one, Murray Leinster three, Eric Frank Russell one, Doc Smith one, George O. Smith six, and Jack Williamson three. Finally, I will take a look at four authors primarily known for their articles. Willie Lay, Robert S. Richardson, John R. Pierce, and G. Harry Stein. Willie Ley had 50 entries. As he was growing up in Germany, Ley was interested in many areas of science. His attention then focused on rockets and the possibilities of space travel. He became a member of the Society for Space Travel along with Werner von Braun. Ley left Germany in 1935 and came to the United States. I have previously mentioned Ley's first article in Astounding, The Dawn of the Conquest of Space. This article correctly presented the basics of rocket propulsion. The January 1938 issue contained the article Rocket Flight by Leo Vernon. He was somewhat less successful in presenting the material correctly. A letter appeared in the May 1938 issue by a science fiction fan named Arthur C. Clarke, who corrected some of Vernon's errors and suggested that a more efficient approach would be for people to just go back and read Lay's earlier article. <laughs> the small amount of fiction that he wrote was appeared as by Robert Willey. Robert S. Richardson was tied with Lay with 50 entries. Richardson received his PhD in astronomy from Berkeley in 1931. As a professional astronomer, his interest was in the sun. 
To the best of my knowledge, all of his articles consider some aspect of astronomy or astrophysics. One article that was a bit different was Turn on the Moon, Make It Hotter, in the November 1943 issue. It presented the difficulties faced by Richardson as the technical advisor for a romantic comedy starring William Powell and, Mer and Hedy Lamarr called The Heavenly Bodies, in which Powell played an astronomer. Richardson also wrote science fiction that appeared as by Philip Latham. John R. Pierce had 21 entries. Pierce received his PhD in electrical engineering from Caltech in 1936. I will mention one incident that occurred at Bell Labs where Pierce worked from 1936 to 1971. In 1947, a team at Bell Labs invented a solid state device that could amplify a signal in the manner of a vacuum tube. Several names had been suggested for the device, but no one cared for any of them. One of the inventors, Walter Bertain, called Pierce into his office. Pierce was then a member of a group working with the device. When the problem was explained, he thought for a bit and then came up with a name by which we know that device today, transistor. Pierce reversed the usual method of using a pen name. Most of his articles appeared by J, as by J.J. Coupling, and most of his fiction as by John R. Pierce. <coughs> G. Harry Stein had 13 entries. Stein received a bachelor's degree in physics from Colorado College. He worked for a time in the aerospace industry, but is best known for his development in the field of model rocketry. Most of his articles between 1960 and 1971 were concerned with rockets and space exploration. Two exceptions were the Star Trek article I mentioned at the beginning and topological electronics in the August 1971 issue. This brief article described the way that it had been found to construct an electronic component using what what many would consider a mathematical curiosity, the Mobius strip. His fiction appeared under the name of Lee Corey. Let us now return to the purposes of the articles. Although the articles were popular, I cannot say how successful they were in educating the readers. Neither can I say how the presence of such articles improved the respectability of astounding or analog. It is possible, however, to point to a few articles that had connections with stories. In May 1944, there appeared an article by Campbell, Beachhead for Science. It was based on the results of Dr. Felix Ehrenhaer, a refugee Austrian physicist who claimed to have experimental evidence for the magnetic monopole, an isolated magnetic charge. Unfortunately, whatever Ehrenhaer was observing were not magnetic monopoles. It is yet to be shown that such particles exist. But Aaron Hamm still managed to find his way into works of science fiction. In Tricky Tonnage, a short story by Malcolm Jameson in the December 1944 issue, an inventor finds a way of siphoning off some of the gravitational mass of an object to make it lighter. At one point he says, it was Aaron Hamm's work with magnetics that got me started. <coughs> The other mention of Aaron Half occurred in one of the John Grimes stories by A. Bertrand Chandler. In Spartan Planet, discussion, a discussion of spaceship propulsion refers to the rather unreliable Aaron Half drive. Two cases exist with a much stronger connection. In the August 1940 issue, a Campbell article, asked by Arthur McCann, don't mention it, looked at the possibilities of atomic power and atomic weapons. Campbell downplayed the idea of an atomic bomb, but suggested the use of radioactive dust to be dispersed over the territory of the enemy. Although a letter from Campbell to Heinlein was also involved, the dust concept presented in Campbell's article led to solution, Heinlein's solution unsatisfactory. The other case involves Dr. Richardson. In July 1943, his article, The World of 61 Signy C, appeared. This article was concerned with the discovery of what we now call an exoplanet, a planet orbiting a star other than our sun. The article described the process of discovery and gave the details of the size of the planet. It turns out that Dr. Strand, who made the discovery, was mistaken. The exo first exoplanet was not discovered until 1995, and subsequent studies of the 6160 Cygni system indicate that there is no planet there. 
how Clement used the characteristics of the planet as the basis for his novel, Mission of Gravity. How do we know this? Clement had an article, World Again Planet, in the June 1953 issue that explained how he came up with the planet Mescla. In his article, Clement does not mention the source for his information. I think we may safely assume, however, that he first came across it in Richardson's 1943 article. There are no doubt additional stories that have connections with articles that appeared in Astounding and Analog. It only remains to find them. We have now come to the end of my exploration of the articles that appeared from 1938 through 1971. As we all know, such articles have continued in Analog until this day. Analyzing the articles that appeared since 1971, however, is the topic for some future presentation. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions for our panelists? Jason's got the mic there. Uh, <clears throat> this isn't really so much of a question, it's just that uh, from Ms. Sharon Packer there. Um, I, as you were giving your talk, I was writing down a whole list of uh, contemporary stories and films that you had to mention, possibly, probably you have them and didn't get a chance to get to them, but I'd like to go offline and talk to you about them afterwards. Sure. Other questions? Oh, another question for Sharon. Um, okay, if I recall correctly from your presentation, Captain Wildwood was the only one involving like brain transfers at that point, uh, involving uh, a, a woman's brain being transferred, right? To my knowledge, yes. Okay, so why, why, why do only guys get? Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, we can say it's a social commentary. You know, with the original man ape stories from uh, Astounding, uh, the man is portrayed as being the savior. He's the one who's going to rescue the damsel in distress, the one who's you know, also shipwrecked with him. And so he's the one who's victimized in the end. So you can say that, but it's a reversal of roles. Um, there, there are a lot of different things you could say depending upon your politics, but I think what happens with, with uh, the last one, um, possibly because of the timeline, we're seeing a uh, real shift in women's roles. During World War II, women were drafted, went to, uh, to work in uh, the factories, Rosie the Riveter. They were taking executive positions uh, that men had left because they went off to war. We see the resurgence of film, a, a surge of films like with uh, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, um, Joan Crawford, where they had these Baracos in these you know, broad-shouldered suits. And this is actually trying to tame that woman to show that she's actually uh, modified by two different men. One is an endocrinologist, one is a surgeon. And the ones who are really in control, according to the film, the ones who are actually in control of whether she's captive or free, are actually two men. So there's a commentary there. Um, but as for why the men get uh, victimized, mm -hmm. you know, I guess that was their turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I want to ask Mr. Schmidt, why is science fiction not more open to humor, and why aren't there more current places to put humor in science fiction? Like, as far as I know, there's no such thing as a science fiction magazine devoted to humor, and in calls for stories, there's very few places where you could put humor if you write humor science fiction. How come that is? I didn't actually see it that way. For instance, I saw analog as being much more open to humor than they could find humor to fill. Uh, I, I, doubt that there, I don't think there is a science fiction humor magazine because there's not enough good science fiction, uh, humorous science fiction being written to fill it. Uh, conceivably, if you got one started, you might be able to get enough people doing it, but it's hard. It's one of the harder kinds of writing to do. I mentioned that I 
aspired to having at least one really good funny story in every issue. I couldn't always do it. I couldn't find them. I, I see my colleagues over here nodding as if they can't find them either. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I specifically the thing that rang true to me is just the observation that the more uh, bars you have to clear, the less material will do that. So it's hard enough finding good science fiction, it's hard enough finding good hard science fiction. Uh, finding good hard funny science fiction, you know, it, it starts to become a diminishing pool. So it would be difficult to run a specific thing, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know that anywhere. I, I don't know of anywhere that is um, that is hostile to humor science fiction. I've read plenty of funny things in analog and Asimov's and uh, FNSF going back thinking about that. I mean, there's plenty of funny fantasy out there. Um, you know, I, I, I think most markets are receptive receptive to it if, if it uh, strikes them. Funny science fiction poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Bob Lundy did a bunch of those. <laughs> More questions? Actually, I actually had a question related to that, and that's, uh, you mentioned that humor is hard to write. I wondered about the experience of editing uh, those humor pieces. I guess <laughs> any of our editors could chime in on that. I, I don't really particularly see it as different from editing anything else. If the humor is there, we'll work with it. If it's not there, we're probably not gonna be able to tell you how to put it in. And the story is that there are two basic categories of humor in fiction. You, there are stories that are primarily humorous. A, a long joke might be a very long joke. Uh, I remember uh, a, a fantasy novel by Rick Cook called Mall Purchase Night, uh, which is the, the title is a pun on Bob Lucas uh, And at one point, it includes a line where. Uh, a, 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 a small mythical creature jumped into a pad of chocolate on the across room and somebody said, what's that? That's a chocolate covered brownie. Uh, <laughs> but you, you have to be in the right mood to pull something like that off and, and, and to sustain it for a whole novel is really hard. The other thing is sprinkle little bits of humor in, into stories that are basically serious and we see a lot of that. It's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to edit primarily for humor. Maybe I should talk to a comedian, comedian school instead. <laughs> sure. um, no. <laughs> Other questions. Thanks. A question for Dr. Osaki. I. We're perhaps shouldn't have been shocked after Dianetics and the Dean Drive and Psy, but I, I was actually upset that you mentioned that one of the non-totally crazy non-fiction articles <coughs> was slightly inaccurate. Was that just the one? I mean, m much of my knowledge of science is implicit rely reliance on non-crazy non-fiction <laughs> articles and analog. Um, or, or were the articles generally not the gospel that I have taken them for? Well, in a lot of cases, I would think that the, uh, the, what was being reported in an article was not necessarily mainstream, mm -hmm. like uh, Aaron Half's magnetic monopoles is, you know, so the fact that it turned out to be wrong, a little off the, little off the mark was, was tough to be expected. Um, okay, so, but I mean, it, it, it did, it wasn't sloppy, it, it accurate, accurately reflected the belief about something that turned out not to be true. Exactly. Okay, so, so I, I don't need to rearrange my entire view of the universe then? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? I could actually add a few words to that. I, I think there was a particular reason that many of the articles were from things that were a little out of the mainstream. And the one thing that Campbell was concerned about was that there were a lot of ideas or items of research that were not well understood and were being pretty much systematically ignored by the scientific establishment. And 
and he wanted to get those exposure just in case there was uh, something there that needed more serious investigation. Um, other questions? We're all good. So right now it's um, uh, almost 4.50. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the panel. Thanks uh, to our presenters.